The September 16, 2020 Transportation and Utilities Committee will come to order. The time is 9.31 and I'm Alex Peterson, Chair of the Committee. Will the Clerk please call the roll? Council President Gonzalez. Uh, mute. Uh, uh, Council Member Morales. Here. Council Member Strauss. Present. Council President Gonzalez, if you found your mute. Hello? She's there. Yeah, She's uh, there. Uh, doing the roll. Pre Here. Thank you. And Chair Peterson. Here. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So we've got four present. We are expecting Councilmember Herbold will announce her arrival when she's here. And um, if there's no objection, today's proposed agenda will be adopted. Hearing no objection, today's agenda is adopted. Next item is the chair's report. I'll, I'll be brief. We have seven items on today's agenda for the Transportation and Utilities Committee. This includes the Internet for All Action Plan and the Bridge Audit Report. We had requested both of these items to be presented to us before the mayor presented her budget to the city council. And so I, I wanna thank the mayor's office, the Seattle Information Technology Team for their Internet for All Report. I wanna thank the city auditor for the bridge audit, which included the cooperation of Seattle Department of Transportation and the mayor's office. A big thank you for their hard work to meet these deadlines, to give everybody better information to make timely decisions. Today on our agenda, we also have five council bills that I'm hoping we can pass out of committee today. And as everybody was signing on today, it was very heartwarming to see all this talent, all these professionals serving the people of Seattle signing on from the different departments and just um, we're really fortunate to have so many people here working for the city in this capacity and we're gonna see their great work today. So at this time, we will open the remote public comment period. I ask that everyone please continue to be patient as we learn to operate this new system in real time. We're exploring ways to fine tune this process it remains the strong intent of the City Council to have public comment regularly included on these meeting agendas. However, the City Council reserves the right to adjust these public comment periods if we deem that the system is being abused or is unsuitable for allowing our meetings to be conducted efficiently and in a manner which uh, we are able to conduct, in the manner we need to conduct our necessary business. So I'll moderate the public comment period in the following manner. Uh, It'll be up to 20 minutes. I don't think we're going to need that today. And each speaker will be given two minutes to speak. I'll call on two speakers at a time, although it looks like we only have one speaker right now. Uh, if you're not registered to speak but would like to, you can sign up before the end of this public comment period, but do it soon. Uh, go to the council website, seattle.gov forward slash council. The public comment link is also listed on today's agenda. Once I call a speaker's name, our staff here will unmute the appropriate microphone and an automatic prompt of you have been unmuted will be the speaker's cue and it's their turn to speak. But the speaker has to press star six to begin speaking. Please remember to press star six. Please begin speaking by stating your name and the item that you are addressing. As a reminder, public comment should relate to an item on today's agenda. Speakers will hear a chime when 10 seconds are left of the allotted time. Once you hear the chime, please wrap up your comment. If speakers do not end their comments at the end of the allotted time, provided the speaker's microphone will be muted to allow us to call into the next speaker. Once you've completed your public comment, we ask that you please disconnect from the line. And if you plan to continue following the meeting, you can do that via Seattle channel or the listening options on the agenda. The public comment period is now open. We will begin with the first speaker on the list. Please remember to press star six before speaking. Uh, that is Eugene Wasserman. Welcome, Mr. Wasserman. And go ahead and press star six to begin speaking. Star six on your phone.
colleagues, Mr. Wasserman is the only speaker signed up, so we're going to give him a few seconds here to. It's showing he is present. Uh, we just need you to press star six, Mr. Wasserman, and begin speaking. Mr. Wasserman, if you're out there, please press star six and begin your comments. So I'm going to ask our city clerk, um, because we're not hearing from Mr. Wasserman, who's our public speaker, signed up here. I, I'd like to close the... Oh, Mr. Wasserman, please go ahead. Yes. Sorry for the confusion. That's all right. um, I, I'm Eugene Wasserman, I'm president of the North Seattle Industrial Association. We represent the businesses and property owners along the Ship Canal. And I'm talking about item two, the bridge audit. Um, we spent a lot of time on bridges with uh, Link Light Rail and also with the city's ballot study. And I've personally been on, spent years on committees on the South Park Bridge and the 520 project. And while we appreciate the audit that was done, we just feel it's a starting point. Um, the city needs to take a really solid look at the bridges that are draw bridges that go over navigable waterways with fish bearing streams. Um, those are expensive things to fix. And if they malfunction, they create a lot of problems for everyone. The Coast Guard rules the waterways, as I think people are finding out on the West Seattle Bridge. And if a bridge gets stuck and can't go up, the city would be forced to decommission it and create a space for the maritime industry. Uh, the estimates on just fixing the mechanisms on the Ballard Bridge, I think around $271 million and close to $5 billion to $500 million to build a new 65-foot bridge. So these things are really expensive, and you need a fully-based program to do them over the next 10, 15 years, which might require federal funding, state funding, and stuff like that. They are different than building the, like the Land Street Railroad Bridge with a road turn to traffic and you're going over solid land. So um, while it looks like you want to ramp up funding for this, I think you need to use next year to create a new category of bridges, door bridges. And also we'd like to see you start on an EIS for the Ballot Bridge. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Washman. And we are joined by council member Lisa Herbold. And Mr. Wasserman was our only speaker signed up this morning. So uh, there's no objection. We'll go ahead and close the public comment period. Um, we are ready to get into our items of business. Um, will the clerk please read item one into the record? Information Technology Department report to the City Council Transportation and Utilities Committee on existing and proposed short-term solutions to increase internet access. Thank you. And before we turn it over to our presenters from the executive, I just want to make a couple of remarks about this, this internet for all report. Uh, it was requested by the City Council via resolution, and I want to thank Council President Gonzalez and Council Member Juarez for co-sponsoring that resolution and also the City Council for voting for it. And, you know, we know Seattle is a city that rightfully prides itself on world-class technology, but the COVID crisis has laid bare the inequities and injustices of the digital divide. And we called on this action plan together as a city council to achieve internet for all because we can no longer allow limited access to the internet to prevent learning, to impede our workers or to hinder our small businesses. It's time that we provide more reliable and affordable access to the internet as part of our city's vital infrastructure. It's important for social justice, education and economic development. This ambitious report from the mayor and her team in collaboration with the city council will spur Seattle's long-term efforts to provide affordable and reliable internet to low-income, BIPOC, and all communities so we can finally achieve internet for all. 
Um, Council President Gonzalez, if you want to say a few words before we jump into it. Um, I'm just to say thank you for bringing it forward and uh, big thanks to V Nguyen in my office for the work she did on um, uh, suggesting some modifications and in engaging with stakeholders. Um, additionally, just to, to, to make sure that we were all on the same page, really do appreciate um, the opportunity to address this issue. I think when we first talked about this issue, I don't think we imagined that um, that we would be in such a virtual world and um, you know certainly internet access and equitable internet access has become even much more important now than ever before so looking forward to the ongoing um, collaboration and work between us and the executive on addressing this important issue thank you chair thank you council president you're you're right this is really a good example of collaboration between the legislative and executive branches and I want to thank Kara Valle on my staff as well and um, central staff and um, glad to see all these uh, great professionals here to present this uh, we've got um, Saad Bashir we've got Brian Hockaday Tracy Cantrell and many others Vin welcome um, so um, go ahead and take it away Saad go ahead Brian Good morning. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Peterson. Uh, for the record, I am Brian Hockaday, Policy Advisor for Mayor Durkin. Uh, and on behalf of the mayor, we want to thank Council and the close partnership with Councilmember Peterson, Council President Gonzalez, Councilmember Juarez, as, uh, uh, as we've all worked together to launch the Internet for All initiative and develop this IFA report that is before you today. As Seattle continues to respond and work to recover from the unprecedented COVID-19 crisis, the importance of reliable and affordable broadband internet has become more critical now than ever before. We also know that access to technology is a race and social justice imperative as we all commit to centering the voices of BIPOC communities and expanding opportunities for youth through upstream investments, including workforce readiness programs. Earlier this spring and throughout the summer, the city immediately got to work to address the internet needs and digital equity disparities that were amplified by the COVID crisis. It quickly became clear that a new strategy and leveraging creative partnerships with community organizations, schools, employers, as well as, as well as private and philanthropic partners would be critical to rising to the occasion at hand. Applying for jobs, going to school, finding health care, and just keeping in touch with our loved ones. All of these tasks have moved online, making internet access vital to the well-being of our communities and the economy. This was the impetus behind the Internet for All initiative. The IFA initiative provides the city of Seattle with a new roadmap and a tangible action plan to close the digital divide and meaningfully increase the adoption of affordable, reliable broadband internet. I'll close again by stating on behalf of Mayor Durkin that we uh, appreciate the alignment with council on these shared priorities. And we look forward to continuing to pursue more partnerships to make sure all families and households have the online resources and digital skills needed to thrive. Thank you. And with that, I'll hand it over to Tracy. Join you today. I want to quickly recap what the Internet for All resolution and the report. We will be presenting an overview of the report in this PowerPoint presentation. We will focus on gap analysis lessons learned and action plan. And again, there is much more detail in the comprehensive report that has been submitted. I wanna remind ourselves that this has been a collection of activity and action by many, and we are looking forward to the presentation and we welcome your feedback. I am joined today by Delia Burke, Alice Lawson and Ving Tang, who will also be helping to present. As we've mentioned, the importance of internet for everyone is critical. It is a race and social justice issue and the pandemic has intensified this. Much of our data is related to the 2018 information, but we know with COVID things have intensified. We work to embrace digital equity and it has been a part of our culture and it will continue to be part of the solution as we look forward to economic recovery.
before we get started in the mechanics of our report, I want to remind ourselves of many of the areas that we are continued to focus on. We are looking for avenues to advance digital equity, and many of those are already in play. We have a tech matching fund. We are looking and have provided public internet access. We continue to promote low cost internet outreach. We have Digital Bridge, which is a new initiative for unemployed workers. And we are partnering with many agencies and highlight, um, for example, the library is initiating a hotspot loan program. Just to add a little more context and remind ourselves that this has been an issue that the city has championed for many years, I want us to remind ourselves of how far we've come and where we need to go. If you look at this chart, you see that we've made substantial progress in universal internet adoption over the years. 2,000, 18%, and now we're about 95%. This doesn't mean that we're done it shows that we have more to do, but we are moving towards universal internet adoption. So how do we help? I think it's important to understand really our current state. The first piece is that we are a well-connected city. If you look, 95% of our households do have internet access. We've moved the needle, especially from 2013 to 2018, but we still have adoption gaps. These are in concentrated geographic areas, and we've also found that this is explained by affordability, not necessarily infrastructure. When we look at who is impacted, 5% of these households, or 17,000 households, these are the people that we are trying to reach. I see Councilmember Herbold has a question. Thank you so much. Um, as it relates to the um, the finding that um, the five percent of households without uh, internet or seventeen thousand households are an outcome of um, affordability challenges and not infrastructure, um, I just want to flag that um, my office has worked with constituents in the past. Um, where it definitely was an infrastructure issue. Um, and um, we worked with both Comcast and Siri, uh, CenturyLink and, and they wanted tens of thousands of dollars to connect certain homes to broadband infrastructure. Um, and so I'm just wondering, does the analysis only cover um, the, uh, the, the gap in access to um, internet for folks for whom there is an affordability issue or does it also include those those pockets throughout the city where there um, is an infrastructure issue and there's there's um, there isn't there isn't access. You will see um, targeted recommendations that ask us that we look at specific areas to address an issue if it is in that specific area. Okay, thank you. So now, um, looking at where the gaps are, I just want to highlight some of the key characteristics of those groups. So we find low income is a very predominantly, it's a high indicator of homes without internet access. Some of these other areas, they're not mutually exclusive, but these are some traits about households without internet access. Older adults are BIPOC community, those with disabilities, or maybe those with non or where English is not their first language. These are all households that may struggle with having internet at home. We find a direct correlation between income. Those over 50,000 do not tend to have an internet access issue or an adoption issue. Those with lower income, especially those under the 25,000 do tend to have adoption issues. Again, I want to highlight that 
we are seeing the gap in specific geographic areas. And so part of this analysis is helping to inform our strategies. When we look at the areas that we see in Seattle, these are the areas that are having the highest issues with internet adoption. So South Central Seattle, Pioneer Square, Yesler Terrace, the International District, South Seattle, New Holly, Rainier Valley, Beacon Hill, West Seattle, High Point and South Park, areas of downtown and Lake City. And you'll see those areas highlighted in the light blue on the map. Again, this information can be used as we develop our strategy. I want to take a moment and look at the feedback that we get with households without internet access. And this again helps inform our strategy. But when you look at the struggles that people are having without internet access, these are the barriers that are most commonly cited. Many indicate that the primary barrier is cost. Some do not have a device to access the internet. Others site credit or deposit requirements. We have a group that simply doesn't know how to use the technology, or they say that the internet is too slow or they don't trust. One of the things that we're finding is it's not just about a single factor. In order to solve this problem, you need to take a collection of these items and solve for all. It doesn't matter if you have access, but you don't know how to use the technology or you may not have a device. So our solutions are meant to look at things holistically. So, in the report, what we do is we outline the gaps and then we move in towards how do we plan our action items. And I want to just highlight that this is a collection of many people's input and organizations. On the top bar, and we'll hear a little bit from Delia in just a moment about those partnerships, but we need to be reaching out to City of Seattle, many departments, the schools, community-based organizations, and private sector. The center of the chart really reflects our North Star. We know that the school districts and their work is very important. What we can do to support them is essential. We want to foster our internet con connections, and we look forward to that universal internet adoption, our real North Star. And we know that we need to focus on increasing the adoption rate, specifically for those with annual incomes under 25. The who represents the bar on the bottom. Students, job seekers, low income, those are the folks that need our help. Delia, can you share a little bit about our partnerships? Sure, thank you, Tracy. So as Tracy mentioned, partnerships have been essential in our digital equity work over the years. And we look forward to deepening these relationships as we implement the Internet for All Action Plan. So the private sector has been a great partner, not only in funding our digital inclusion efforts, but also in donating equipment and lending technical expertise to various projects. Philanthropy plays a role, and we're looking to align with new initiatives coming forth, like All in Washington, for example. Anchor institutions like the Seattle Public Schools, the Seattle Public Library, Seattle Housing Authority, they have all been key partners for the city in helping us reach those residents, students, and families who are the most disconnected. And our community-based organizations, so they're critical to this work. They are the trusted ambassadors in delivering direct services to our most vulnerable BIPOC residents. Um, and we've had the honor to partner with over 360 community groups through the Technology Matching Fund program. And we also look to regional collaboration by working with King County and the state of Washington as well as engaging with local boards and networks like the Community Technology Advisory Board, the Innovation Advisory Council, and the Digital Equity Learning Network. And now I'll pass this over to Vin Tang. Delia, 
This slide points to the lessons learned in the report. Uh, the resolution asks us to study city <laughs> and, and access and adoption. We, we looked at recent news from cities that have announced digital equity initiatives because of COVID-19. Reports examining broadband and municipal fiber systems, both Seattle-specific studies and national studies, and the digital equity plans of several major cities. The lessons learned closely align with our proposed strategies and actions, including what you see on the slide. Prioritize residents with lower incomes. Device programs and skills training are as important as getting connected to the internet. And reduce sign-up barriers and work with the community to build awareness to ensure residents connect to available resources. On the screen, you will see the symbol for National Digital Inclusion Trailblazers. Seattle is one of 15 cities to receive this recognition for advancing broadband access. For a city with our internet infrastructure, high internet adoption rate, and our sustained history of digital equity work, it is recommended to use a micro target approach to prioritize and allocate resources okay. to close the remaining gap. We now return to Tracy to present how we develop the action plan. Thank you. Thank you, Vin. So again, as we heard from Delia and we heard from Vin, as we put our action plan together, what we wanted to do is leverage the lessons learned, um, rely and cultivate our partnerships with internal and external stakeholders and use this information to formulate our action plan. We're focused, when we look at the gaps, we're focused on those geographic areas. We're taking advantage of our infrastructure and we're looking at the root cause. And again, we're looking for a holistic look at digital equity when we put together our action plans. What, <laughs> um, I'm sorry, what, um, what we're going to do now is we have eight action plan strategies. What we'll do is we'll look at these individually with a couple examples so that you get a flavor of how we plan on proceeding with addressing the internet for all. I want to, um, next, we're going to hear from Alice on a couple of our first strategies. Good morning, everybody. I'm Alice Lawson, and I'm going to speak to our first two strategies, which are areas where the city has already been doing a lot of work over the years and has been a big contribution to why we are up to a 95% adoption rate at this point. Um, these are key areas that will help us continue to close our digital divide, and we're going to continue to emphasize them. The first one is we want to continue to increase the awareness and adoption of programs for low-cost access to Internet service and devices in the city. And as we can see from our 2018 Tech Access study, uh, we only had a 15, 53% awareness uh, response rate for these programs. So this is something where COVID has really helped us. Um, since COVID, it, there's been really ramped up efforts with our community-based partners who have always been our partners in this effort, as well as the Office of Cable Communications here at the city um, to make sure that the clients who have intensified needs for connectivity are understanding and getting support to sign up for these low cost programs. Um, this includes collaboration we've done with Seattle Public Schools and helping them set up programs where they can sponsor some of these low cost programs for student households. So the households don't have to pay for the service for um, up to six months initially is what the school has. So there's a lot of good work that's been done in these first short months um, to have people know about and adopt these programs uh, for services and devices. But we know that the low cost service programs aren't uh, a perfect solution for people who don't have stable housing. And that's because these programs require a wireline connection. So the digital equity study told us, and also this real time interaction with community based organizations over the last months, that we have a lot of people where a wireline connection is not a good solution and they need a mobile option for connect connectivity. So that pushes us towards our second strategy, was a, which is a continued focus on expanding our public Wi-Fi that's available. And particularly, we're going to focus in on our digital equity areas that were mentioned um, earlier in the presentation. You know, we've identified through our research that we think these are areas where if we could expand public Wi-Fi, it will have the greatest impact for community members to have free access through their mobile devices for an internet connection. 
uh, and we are going to, um, as an, a more immediate uh, activity, have Seattle Public Libraries is working to deploy Wi-Fi outside their branches in Q4 of this year, and we're going to be looking strategically throughout the city, uh, city community centers, where we already have internal connectivity, how we might make that external also, and through partnerships with private telecommunication providers who might have infrastructure in the area. Tracy? Thank you, Alice. So looking ahead to um, strategy number three, we have partner with our organizations. This strategy really reflects how we're continuing to partner with organizations to include and provide digital inclusion programs. Some of the examples that we have here are to continue our programs, for example, the digital bridge. It's also meant to recognize that we have um, in a holistic model that we need to help with, for example, a train the trainer model so that we provide not only the access, but the additional skills needed to provide a complete picture for residents that need internet access. There's a digital navigator suggested as part of our action plan. Strategy number four regards private sector and philanthropic support. Again, we've seen a great outreach with our business and technology communities about wanting to help. We need to partner with these organizations to secure the support that we need for Internet for All. There has been tremendous positive engagement from the private sector for this initiative, and we thank them. Next, I want to highlight strategy number five, which really has to do with championing legislation and policies. So there's much going on at the state and federal level, and we want to continue to champion those causes. The Digital Equity Act is just one example. And we can take a look inwards as well, exploring what policies we have, for example, to enable, enable internet access for all new affordable housing investments. Those are just a couple of components that we can look at as part of our action plan. Strategy number six looks at our regional collaboration. We know that there has been a tremendous amount of work that is happening today, all within the same geographic area. We have much with community-based organizations. We have city action. We have county action. Having a stronger regional collaboration for these many, many different avenues is a recommendation in the report. Alice, back to you. Thank you. So strategy number seven is working to align with the COVID mitigation type efforts that have been going on to provide and address some of these connectivity and digital equity needs. Um, during this time, ISPs, our internet service providers and our telecommunication providers in the city have really stepped up and been great partners in helping us meet the needs of low cost residents for affordable and increased connectivity. One of the things that we do to measure our success towards a universal adoption is our tech access study, but we don't do that until every four years. So getting more data in the interim years about the success at this, these low cost program adoptions is going to be key for us to track our progress. So that's going to be a strategy to, to work with the carriers who have that data to try to get access to it so we can see um, how much success we've been getting in the, in the short term towards better adoption. And that will help us keep our focus then and our strategy on where there might be lingering gaps, whatever the data might reveal. Um, another focus area is that during COVID, we have had some successful outcomes. So one of them, for example, is the low cost internet programs provided in the city. Prior to March, they offered 10 to 18 megabit service, which was substandard even by the federal 
broadband definition. And as of March, the companies increased that to a 25 megabit service, and they have committed to keep that as the ongoing service level for these programs. So we think that's a real successful outcome. But we also know that having so many people in households trying to connect at the same time um, has caused some service and uh, speed constraints. Uh, we get complaints of that. And so we believe that the 25 megabit service is a baseline and we want to continue to have a strategy that focuses on how can we increase the service levels for our low cost programs, especially for those with families where there's multiple users in the household. And our eighth strategy, and this kind of goes to what you were saying, Council Member Herbal, about these pockets we have in the city where there's not been um, traditional wireline connectivity or the connectivity hasn't been upgraded in a way to give someone what they consider as modern wired connectivity. We need to constantly, and we are constantly tracking new technologies that are emerging to offer internet service specifically, but also to increase the capacity of existing service and systems. And there's a lot going on in this area. We've listed some here on the slide and we talk about them a little bit in the report, but these are all opportunities we think are important to consider um, to help us with the micro-targeting when we find specific need areas. You know, maybe um, one of these solutions would work in one area, but not necessarily another. So for example, in an area where there isn't wireline connectivity, um, maybe it's a block that for some reason it wasn't built out and now it's hyper expensive to do that. Maybe the solution is some kind of a fixed wireless or even a increased uh, satellite internet as those options are improving. So we're gonna continue to track those and think this is an important part of the ecosystem of the internet to always be aware of the innovation that's going on and to closely monitor that and align that with the needs as they continue to arise and we become aware of them. So Tracy, back to you. Thank you, Alice. So just for a quick wrap up, um, I wanna highlight some of the timeline and key milestones. And so our work has been in 2020, really we've uh, put energy and effort into the report with an emphasis to gap analysis. We continue to support the schools we are continuing our private and par partnership and community engagement with different organizations. And again, fostering those connections. Those are work that is underway and will continue. In 2021, we're looking to provide an update and uh, provide a little more explanation on evaluation outcomes, for example. And then again, continuing to provide updates and partner on how we develop an internet for all fund. Looking ahead to 2022 and 2023, again, really our North Star, um, the data points to universal internet adoption in those years. And we are going to focus on the areas of need. Um, want to remind ourselves that areas or households with annual incomes under 25 is a key um, group for us to help move the needle on. So those are an overview of the timeline and the key milestones. We want to um, have a few words from our CTO, but quickly we'll discuss our next steps. And Tracy, if I may ask a question here about the milestones, if you could go back to that slide, just to clarify a couple of items on this. This is really important so that we are measuring our success. And um, I know the resolution also called for uh, an evaluation uh, of how we're doing. And so looking at our progress to goals will be really important. So I wanted to clarify on the 20,000 internet connections and devices that that is um, 20,000 internet connections plus 20,000 devices. I think what this will represent is what the need is. What I, we may, have internet connections and don't need devices. You may need devices, but already have the internet connection. Our goal will be to report back on what is required to meet the need. And that, that makes sense overall, but I know you all came up with the 20,000 number, probably based partly on the 17,000 
uh, plus households uh, with the gap. So I just wanted to confirm we're not um, saying that this 20,000 number is uh, both, uh, it's, it's combining internet connections and devices, so you're not you're doing correct. Okay. Yeah, you're right. correct, absolutely, council member, that it may be, is, there may be some overlap and it may be more than, uh, more than some cases. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that question. Did you want me to go ahead, Tracy? Sure. Yeah, um, and, and I won't take too much of your time, uh, council members. Uh, thanks again for the opportunity for us to present. I was speaking with a counterpart in another city in the US and uh, speaking about this report coming up and when they heard about the 95% mark, uh, you know, they seemed to suggest that the mission was accomplished because uh, in their particular region, 95 would be a really uh, aggressive target. And I said to that person, and I'm sharing it with you folks, that for us, this remains work in progress. Uh, we are challenging ourselves that we're not going to stop on what we need to do to bring that 17,000 number down to zero. And so the more you can put us on the spot and expect that we come back to you with regular updates on some of the work that we have put in front of you, uh, the better. Uh, because now we need to do some really micro level uh, targeted uh, strategies because we're talking about a very small chunk of Seattle that have very specific needs. And so our strategies and our tactics are going to align with those. needs. And with that, any questions that any council member have, we'll be happy to take. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, council members, any questions for Seattle Information Technology or the mayor's office? And, and I know you may have questions, you know, feel free to ask them obviously at any time, but if you have any questions now, they are welcome. Councilmember Morales. Thank you. Um, I, I do want to thank this team. I know this is a uh, layered and complex and um, huge undertaking. So I appreciate the work that has gone into this um, report and the work that you're doing uh, to try to reach out to community. I have to say, though, that I feel um, a little bit frustrated um, because what I hear you saying is that there is a small, you know, percentage of our community that has, for many different reasons, has trouble accessing the Internet. Um, I'm sure a lot of that is language, affordability, uh, just really lacking the infrastructure, um, lacking an understanding of how the Internet works at all. And so it seems counterintuitive to me that the answer to that problem is to suggest uh, research on assorted technologies, different needs, uh, different, you know, assorted different programs and, um, and initiatives. Um, and I'm not sure how that solves the problem of, um, you know, uh, speaking from my, my district in particular, a community that has layers of challenges. Um, it seems to me that a more holistic and a more, um, a more uniform approach would make it easier. There would be one thing to explain, one way to access, one way to pay for things, um, and that is to move toward um, making this a public utility. Um, so I know that's a, a bigger and different conversation, but I just want to say that, you know, speaking for the District 2, folks in District 2 who have many of the challenges that you are talking about, um, offering a menu of different things to different people doesn't seem like the right approach to uh, solving the problem. Could I speak to that just really quickly? Um, so Alice Lawson and I'm with the, the broadband and, and uh, cable program. And what, so this presentation did definitely heavily emphasize the service access portion of it, but our work definitely has been holistic in looking at digital equity as being uh, access to the internet, access to a device, knowing how to use a device and knowing how to use the applications that are on that device. And a lot of that type of work is with our community-based organizations. So that that is part of it. I think you'll see more of that in the report. Um, and that's definitely something that's a, a key focus for us. One of the programs we've stood up um, in the last 
few months with Office of Economic Development in the Seattle um, Jobs Initiative called Digital Bridge. That's very much what that program is doing. It's giving them the device. It's giving them you know, one-on-one -on -one skills training. Seattle Public Libraries has already done that. So we definitely have work. We know that's where a profound need is. It's not enough to tell us, turn it on in somebody's house or give them a mobile hotspot. That is just the very beginning. And it's a lot of hard one-on-one -on -one work often to help with those other solutions. And so that's why we as a city really have to rely on our community organizations who work with those residents and know their specific needs and languages. And so some of our strategies are supporting those organizations in that at that level. Thank you, Alice. And if I can just uh, build on that council member, uh, there was a slide where we showed uh, six different reasons, broad reasons why there are those gaps that exist. Uh, one of them was about device. The other one was about, we just don't know how to get internet access. And so when we, maybe the subtle point to make is that when we talk about uh, strategies. We're talking about coming up with a holistic strategy for each one of those six areas. Uh, last thing we want to do is confuse the, the the person on the other end that we're looking to help by swamping them with uh, 10 different types of options that they may not be able to uh, perhaps choose from. So we, we definitely want to target as simple of a solution as possible, uh, but do it holistically for each one of those six areas. Thank you for that question, Councilmember Morales. And, and I know when the mayor submits her budget, we'll be looking carefully at how the dollars are allocated so that we can close the digital divide. And you know, you mentioned in your slide one of the strategies about training the trainers and, and getting people um, more comfortable with the devices. It has to be you know, culturally competent and there'll be lots of language barriers that we need to overcome. So, you know, in terms of whether that means that we need to uh, fund more um, community groups um, that you know, already have those connections and speak those languages to get to, to expand this, this access and adoption. That's something we could also handle uh, during the budget process, even though we're facing you know, massive budget deficit, probably for the operating budget and the capital budget. There, if we spend our money wisely, I'm hoping we can move the needle forward on this and, and meet these milestones. And you'll be back to our committee, um, um, you know, in a few months as well. So we'll have the fall budget process and then you'll be coming back. And so that we can see how the progress is going and decide whether we need to um, uh, focus on other paths as well. Okay, council colleagues, any final questions for them while they're here? Okay, well, I'd like to thank everybody from the mayor's office and Seattle Information Technology for all your hard work. Now the hard work will continue to actually implement this, um, but but really appreciate the uh, the cooperation, collaboration on this, this effort, and we'll continue to, um, to ask the tough questions and try to move the needle forward on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so we're on to item two on our agenda. Will the clerk please read item two into the record? Presentation by Seattle Office of the City Auditor, strategic approach to vehicle bridge maintenance is warranted. Thank you. So we have with us our city auditor and for the folks viewing, um, the city auditor is part of the legislative branch of government. Um, you know, the federal government has something similar with the general accounting office and you know, it's very useful, to, um, very important office uh, to help the city council, help the legislative branch look into things going on in the executive branch. And um, you know, with a $6.5 billion all funds budget, there's lots to look at. And um, so we, uh, this report was um, after the West Seattle bridge closure, the questions came up about how are our other bridges doing? What are their physical conditions? Is there something that we could be doing differently? So I wanna thank uh, the council president for enabling this uh, report as well. And, um, um, Lisa Herbal and uh, has obviously been very involved with West Seattle Bridge, and so we uh, this report. Um, there have been media reports about this already, so 
uh, we're eager to uh, hear directly from the city auditor today. I think um, Seattle Department of Transportation cooperated very much on this report, generally concurs with these recommendations in this in this audit report. Uh, so we will hear a little bit from, from SDOT as, as well. Uh, but I'd like to turn it over to our, our city auditor, David G. Jones. Thank you, Council Member Peterson. Uh, I just want to thank you for making the request for this audit. I think it's a very timely topic. Uh, and so thank you for bringing it to our office. Uh, I just want to tell the viewing public, uh, if you want to see a copy of the report, you know, you can see it through the agenda for this council committee, but it's also available on our office's website, which is www.seattle dot gov slash city auditor. Um, what I'd like to do now is turn it over to the people who really did the work on the audit and Sean DeBlick, the deputy city auditor and Jane Dunkel will be taking you through this, but I would be remiss if I did not uh, thank Melissa Alderson for her work on this and also Louisa uh, Brabato Montesanti uh, who helped up on this audit. Many thanks to them for getting this done. As you said, council member Peterson in a, in a really quick, timely manner because you needed it, the committee needed it, the council needed it before budget. So I'd like to turn it over now to uh, Sean and Jane. Thanks, David. Uh, good morning, Committee Chair Peterson, Council President Gonzalez, and uh, committee members. For the record, my name is Sean DeBleek. I'm with the Office of the City Auditor. Today, my colleague Jane and I will be providing you with highlights from our audit of Seattle's Bridges. This audit was, of course, prompted over concerns about the city's bridge portfolio following the emergency closure of the West Seattle High Bridge this past March. I want to make it very clear from the beginning that our audit was not an investigation into the specifics of that bridge, but it was instead a look at the broader conditions of our bridges, the investments we as a city have made in their maintenance and upkeep, and recommendations for SDOT, as well as the city, to take to preserve and protect our transportation system. Uh, next slide, please. The three key takeaways of our audit are listed here. First of all, based on condition, Seattle's bridge portfolio is similar to other cities in the United States, but since most of our nation's bridges are aging and in need of more costly repairs and upkeep, this is not a great place to be. Second, we found that on one hand, SDOT is spending the amount set by the budget on bridge maintenance, and that's good news. But on the other hand, the amount needed for the upkeep of our bridges is far greater than what our city historically has set aside for these purposes. Third, we have several recommendations for SDOT to address that will help us shift from a more reactive approach to the upkeep of our bridges and to establish what experts call a strategic bridge preservation program. Before handing it over to Jane, I wanna say that SDOT is taking steps in that direction and has concurred with nine of 10 of our recommendations and partially concurred with one of them. Jane? Yes, um, good morning. So this next slide um, shows what we looked at. We looked at 77 vehicle bridges that SDOT owns and maintains. And just a couple technical notes, SDOT often speaks about um, having 124 bridges, but that includes um, bridges that includes pedestrian bridges tunnels bridges shorter than 20 feet and bridges owned jointly with other jurisdictions so that's the difference between the 124 and the 77. Um, and another technical note is that we used federal highway administration national bridge inventory nbi data for our analysis and sometimes nbi counts bridges based on their engineering components so in other words they might count what we would consider to be one bridge as two. And in this instance, they counted the university bridge as two bridges. So when you look at the bottom of this slide, um, this is what we found. We found 22 in good condition, 50 in fair, and five in poor, although really the five in poor are essentially four. Um, Fairview Avenue North, which is in the process of being replaced, Magnolia, Second Avenue South Extension Bridge, and the University Bridge. And um, as we saw in the last slide, most Seattle, Seattle me, vehicular Jane. bridges are, yes? Excuse me, Jane, uh, Count, uh, Vice Chair Strauss has a question. Oh, okay. Oh, thanks, and, and Jane, uh, my question is on slide two, or three, slide three. This is very helpful for us to understand which bridges within our city are in good, fair, and poor condition. And as you mentioned, we're already intervening in some of the poor condition areas. When 
we chatted yesterday, we discussed how the Minneapolis, the bridge in Minneapolis was in fair condition and the bridge on I-5 in, Snohom in Skagit County was also in fair condition when the, they both collapsed. And those collapses were due to uh, external variables in Minneapolis, there was construction load as well as um, construction occurring and rush hour traffic. And in Skagit County, uh, an oversized truck struck one of the structural beams. Um, when we're looking at these bridges, is it your sense that without an external variable that these fair, these bridges that are in fair condition, uh, as long as they are receiving inspection should be fine? Um, Sean, do you want to take that question? Sure. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Strauss. Um, I would, the NBI data are not granular enough, I think, to make a determination like you're suggesting there. What you need to have is ongoing inspections. Um, so bridges are required to be inspected every, at least every two years, and then certain components are inspected on a more frequent um, rotation. And using the NBI data to determine what needs to be replaced or fixed um, wouldn't be a good idea. Great, thank you so much. I just, I guess my question was also highlighting the fact that even if we have a bridge that is in fair condition, if an external variable comes into play, then we could see the bridge having substantial problems like what happened in Skagit County. Uh, looking at the Fourth Avenue South Bridge, is there a way? How do we determine the the length of use that that bridge has? Um, you do that by a very fine-grained analysis of the bridge's useful life. So the design, the original design life for the age of the bridge, impact that, but there's not a direct correlation. So that's why we have one of the recommendations in our report that SDOT really update the useful life of their bridges based on um, on current condition data down to the component level. So that's how you do it. You inspect them by component and then look at it that way. Is that, is that helpful? Sean, do you wanna add anything to that? No, thank we'll you. We'll have Council Member Herbold in a, in a moment after Sean. Oh, okay. Council Member Herbold, please. Thanks. Um, not not another question, but just a response to Councilmember Strauss's um, um, earlier um, observation about the fair uh, rated bridges and, and his question. Um, just recognizing, of course, that the West Seattle Bridge was one of the bridges rated fair. My my, if that if correct me if I'm wrong, I'm pretty yeah. sure that's. You are correct, and uh, you are correct. And so, when we, it, when SDOT implements the recommendation about looking at the bridges in a more granular component by component measure, I think what we'll find, or one hypothesis, is that these, the 50 bridges in fair condition, there are going to be some of those that show a more immediate need to to address uh, a concern absent even an, ex an external uh, um, uh, it, it involvement as, as Councilmember Strauss was pointing out. Yes, yes. Is Jane and Sean, is that your understanding when you do a component by component analysis that some of these bridges in the, the broader fair condition may, may indicate that they have a more immediate need of repair? That's certainly possible. Yes. Councilmember Peterson, this is Lorelai Williams from SDOT. Do you mind if I speak for a quick moment? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Lorelai. I, I just wanted to add to what was said. Um, we have an inspection frequency for all of our bridges, and that's where we get these ratings and results. And when we see things that um, give us concern or uh, create any inability for the bridges to not carry the traffic or loading that they're carrying, we take action. So I just wanted to point out that um, if we saw anything in those inspections that would change things, we would take action on them. And, and I think for this discussion, we'll go ahead and have the auditor run through their entire report and then um, if SDOT has any uh, comments at the end, um, just note things during the presentation. At the end, we can hear from SDOT and then we'll have the city auditor wrap it up for us at, at the very end, if that's okay. 
please continue, uh, Sean and okay. Jane. Thank you. So um, let's see. Uh, as we as we noted, um, most Seattle vehicular bridges are in fair condition, but again, this is not necessarily good news as many Seattle bridges are old. In fact, the median age of the 77 vehicular bridges that we analyzed is 70 years and some are reaching the end of their expected lifespan and will need more costly repairs or to be replaced. Also, things have gotten worse in the last nine years. During this period, 15 bridges worsened in condition and only six improved. This slide, um, for context, we compared Seattle to five peer jurisdictions that also had large bridge portfolios and had either similar populations, bridge issues, or geographic challenges. And the takeaway from this slide is that Seattle is not an outlier in terms of the condition of its bridge portfolio. But once again, this is not necessarily good news as uh, many jurisdictions na nationwide have unfunded bridge maintenance needs. In fact, the Federal Highway Administration estimates that of the 614,000 public bridges in the United States, an annual investment of 24.6 billion is needed to eliminate the backlog of national bridge maintenance by the year 2032. So this is, this is a national issue. Um, for this slide, we go back to SDOT and to their um, maintenance. We examined for a 14 year period, we compare the budget SDOT was given for bridge maintenance and what they spent. The orange line in the graph is the actual expenditures and the blue line is the budget. And the purpose of this visual is to show that for the most part, SDOT spends what it's allocated for bridge maintenance. There are two exceptions. Exceptions, um, one example is underspending in 2008, but overspending in 2009. This was a planned cycle as SDOT sometimes saves funds from one year to use the next year on a larger project. So that is something that is just to be expected. The other exception is 2016 to 2018, where SDOT underspent their budget. And SDOT officials told us that this was due to the fact that they did not have enough staff hours needed to complete the work. And for context, at the SDOT division responsible for bridge maintenance, the Roadway Structures Division, um, has 51 employees. This includes the interim director, supervisors, managers, and administrative staff, as well as the engineers who conduct inspections and maintenance crews. They also have bridge operators not included in that number, but they don't do maintenance work. Furthermore, in addition to bridge maintenance, these employees are responsible for, in addition to bridges, retaining walls, stairways, areaways, review of construction permits that affect transportation assets, and assisting with transportation-related emergency response. And we'll talk more about the impact of this work and other work that SDOT does for external parties later in this presentation. Councilmember Herbold. It's my recollection that the um, levy spending plan um, puts limits on uh, allocations of funding according to different categories um, in a way that um, might make it more difficult to spend more money on uh, bridge maintenance. Did you take a look at the, the, um, the transportation levy spending plan to see uh, about those limitations? Um, we did not specifically. We looked at what was in the levy for bridges. I don't have that figure right in front of me, but um, we did look at that. And at the at the end, we can ask uh, Lorelai Williams if she wants to address that. That's a good question about the move Seattle levy limitation. Thank yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, so finally, SDOT estimates that more funding is needed. I don't think this is a surprise to anyone. We just wanted to give some background on how they come up with their estimates. They use an industry rule of thumb to calculate what they should be spending each year on bridge maintenance to maintain a bridge in a state of good repair. And a state of good repair is one where the bridge can operate at a full level of performance. The industry standard is that SDOT should spend from one to 3% of total replacement cost on the bridge maintenance on bridge maintenance every year. And so we used the 3.4 billion replacement value for all SDOT bridges over 60 years old at 1%. That's a minimum of 
34 million a year they should be spending. And we found that average annual spending on bridge maintenance for the last 14 years was 6.6 .6 million. So even with the most conservative estimate, SDOT needs another 27 million per year to keep up with bridge maintenance. And that, so now Sean's gonna talk about some of the things SDOT should do to ensure they make the best use of any new resources they are able to obtain. Sean? And, and I, I think that's a really good point. I wanna emphasize that last, that previous slide, if you don't mind going back to it, which is the 1% um, the figure that's been quoted in the media. So SDOT on average spending 6.6 .6 million, but yet um, should be spending 34 million. That is based on the 1%, but it's really one to 3% that would be the, the best practice. And so really you could be over a hundred million dollars uh, if you did up to the 3%. So I think that's, that's a really important point that the gap is large. Thank you. Yeah. Very good point. Super. Um, uh, thank you, Jane. Thank you, Council Member. Um, for the second half of our presentation, I'm going to focus on four key areas for SDOT to address as they move towards a proactive bridge preservation program. Um, first off is laying the groundwork for using any maintenance funds efficiently and effectively. Now this slide here shows a deterioration curve and illustrates where investments in bridge maintenance make the most sense. That is up in the green zone where conditions are fair and good. And the reason it makes sense is by investing in that um, area, you're gonna extend the useful life of the bridge. Um, as Jane mentioned, there is a very large gap between what is needed for bridge maintenance and what the city historically sets aside for that purpose. But in order to close that gap, SDOT needs to know how long each bridge, and in particular, each major component of each bridge is going to last. Now, right now, SDOT has the information in the y-axis for those components, knowing its condition, but it lacks the information in the x-axis, how long these things are supposed to last. And without it, the city cannot effectively and efficiently program money to the bridges that need the, mo need the money the most. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to emphasize this point again, but we note here that the importance of having that information that was shown in the X axis, you need to know again where to put the money you have in order to get the most out of it. So our recommendation in this area is to update the useful life estimates, use that information to plan the maintenance work, and with those items in place, develop strategies to close the funding gap. Next slide, please. Um, the second of the four items is compliance risk. SDOT's inspection and maintenance practices are audited by the federal government on a, a multi-year cycle. In preparation for their next formal audit, which takes place in 2023, SDOT proactively invited officials from the Federal Highway Administration and WashDOT to do an informal review of the bridge program um, this past fall. According to the federal and state officials that conducted that review, they found some items and leaving those items unaddressed could lead to audit findings and put us out of the running for federal dollars and lead to administratively burdensome oversight. So our recommendation is for SDOT to immediately move forward to address the issues identified in that um, informal review. Next slide. The third area where we recommend changes to be made is in regard to reimbursable work. This picture here shows an SDOT bridge crew inspecting a structure that belongs to Seattle City Light. These SDOT employees have critical skills that are of course beneficial to other city departments. And they're also, they're also doing reimbursable work for the state and for the county. We found that the amount of reimbursable work is significant. About 20% of the work done by the bridge maintenance is not on SDOT bridges. The next slide, please. The issues that we identified are of course, one, it means that less is being done on the bridges um, that could be done given current resources. And the second item is that it changes the type of work that's being done on our bridges. Now, the first point is pretty self-evident. So I'm just going to uh, talk more briefly about the second. According to SDOT officials that we spoke with, maintenance crews may choose to do smaller bridge jobs in order to accommodate the time that they need to do the reimbursable work. This is like putting the cart before the horse. The impact is that the work that could be more beneficial for the bridges might not be done and because of a timing issue with the reimbursable work. So our recommendation here is for SDOT to reduce the amount of reimbursable work that they do with the bridge crews. Uh, next slide, please. 
The fourth and final area that I'm going to talk about today has to do with the oversight of private bridges like the one shown here. This structure is a pedestrian bridge in the Interbay neighborhood. And while it's not owned by the city, SDOT inspectors are required to do a safety inspection on this and other private bridges every year. Now, of course, the safety of these private bridges is very, very important, but the frequency and type of inspection work is probably unnecessary given current bridge standards and the inspections and oversight that the owners also provide. The next slide. We discovered that the reason that SDOT is doing this work on an annual basis for these bridges is not necessarily because it increases the safety of the bridges. Rather, it's an old requirement from an ordinance from about 50 years ago, which is shown to the right. It's worth noting that back then in 1968, there was very little oversight of bridges anywhere in the country. So at that time, having an ordinance like this really made sense. Our recommendation is for SDOT to use its expertise to review this old ordinance and propose a new one that makes sense for this day and age. Uh, next slide, please. Um, all right, back to the key. Council member Strauss, pardon me, Sean, Council member no Strauss. Thanks, Chair Peterson. Um, and Sean, I was hoping to speak to you about the private bridges slide. Uh, yep, this is perfect. So I understand that newer bridges are built with a higher structural integrity. However, we do have a number of older bridges uh, privately owned throughout the city. I'm thinking of the one on Westlake, for instance, which the property owner was um, not maintaining because they were in the process of deciding whether to take down the bridge or to retain it. In doing so, it was very important that SDOT maintained the inspections of that pedestrian bridge that was privately held uh, because without proper maintenance, it was beginning to deteriorate. Um, can you, do you have recommendations as far as if there is a year that the bridge was built that fewer inspections should take place or is there further guidance or is your guidance simply that we need to reassess this and update this, uh, this ordinance? So our recommendation really leaves that um, operationalization of the ordinance and what specifics would be into it um, up to the experts at SDOT. Um, from our work uh, on this issue, what we found is that um, using something really broad like the age of the bridge or what kind of um, entity owns it is not specific enough to address safety risks for bridges. You could have a very new bridge that's unsafe. You could have an old bridge that is safe. Um, so it, it really does depend. So what we're asking SDOT to do is to use their expertise to develop something that, um, you know, basically fits with the variety of bridges that we have in that, that area. Great, thank you. All right, I think we're on, yes. Great, slide 15. Um, finally, uh, I want to return to the overall message of our audit. First off, of all, bridge conditions might look like other places in the country but that's not a good place for us as far as bridge portfolios go. Second, the city needs to invest more in bridge maintenance and SDOT has been able to spend the money that um, has been allocated for that purpose. And third, adding more money is not the only thing that needs to get done. As I described, the updating estimated useful life of the bridges um, needs to happen and there are other areas that should be addressed, including in, um, addressing the informal review findings from the Federal Highway Administration, reducing the amount of reimbursable work that the SDOT maintenance crews do, and updating um, the oversight of private bridges. All right, last slide. Um, in conclusion, I really want to emphasize um, our gratitude to SDOT for their cooperation throughout this audit, and to note that they are taking steps now um, to implement many of our recommendations. If, uh, uh, Chair Peterson, if I just might add to uh, just for the public, and I know you, council members are aware of this and departments, but uh, any recommendation in our report, we follow up on until it has either been implemented or closed. So uh, just to note on that, the, the recommendations we have made, it's not like we just make them and walk away. We will be touching base annually with uh, SDOT to see what progress they made on these recommendations. Thank you, Auditor Jones. And um, we're gonna hear from SDOT briefly and then from the city auditor again, in case there's any final information, but Councilmember Herbold, please. And you're on mute. I just wanna um, 
put on the table one question for SDOT and then also um, a question for um, the auditor. Um, the question for SDOT is, um, relates to the uh, bridge load level rating. Um, I was uh, under the impression that because of um, load level rating regulations out of the federal government that um, SDOT needed to sort of uh, re-rate um, the load levels for the bridges and that that was going to actually be um, uh, part of this audit, but I understand that it's possible that it, it couldn't be part of this audit if, if that was still work that SDOT needed to do. Um, and then my other, my other question uh, relates more to um, the fact that this, um, this focus on maintenance around bridges uh, raises, I think, um, a, a broader question for um, uh, asset uh, maintenance of uh, other SDOT um, uh, capital uh, structures. Uh, which I understand there's not been an asset management study um, since 2015, um, and you can you can see that from from taking a look at that at that asset management study and taking a look at um, the value of particular types of infrastructure, um, it you can see that it, the the information contained within it is 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 dated, um, and so given that we've taken sort of this deep dive on bridges and and learned what we've learned on bridges, does it make sense to also do it with things like arterial pavement and um, you know other um, other hard assets that um, SDOT is responsible for doing maintenance on? We can hear from uh, Lorelai can probably address that, um, but I agree with you. I know that uh, one of the points Director Zimbabwe had made is when we were decided to do the bridge audit is to remind us of all the other assets that they have to to manage, and so um, I think they they have a shared interest in this. So, um, but if we can turn it over to SDOT for a brief remarks and then um, see if the auditor has anything to add. Thank you, Councilmember Peterson. Uh, so I uh, wanted to share a few thoughts from SDOT uh, in summary, and then also I will roll into uh, working to answer the questions that I heard during the course of the presentation. So um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for having SDOT here at the table today. Uh, my name is Lorelai Williams, and I'm the Deputy Director for Capital Project Delivery at SDOT. Um, we want to explicitly thank Councilmember Peterson for initiating this audit. Um, and we also want to thank the Office of the, of the City Auditor for their excellent work and the professional way that they handled putting this report together. Um, I would be remiss if I also didn't mention and thank our SDOT team led by um, our Interim Roadway Structures Division Director, Matt Donahue and our finance team for putting in the time and working very closely with the city auditor's office. Um, as you can imagine, there was a lot of information to gather and put forward. Um, it was an incredibly collaborative um, experience for all of us. And um, from SDOT to the city, to the people of Seattle as a whole, we stand to benefit a great deal from the process and the report itself. It definitely uh, highlights and calls attention to um, our maintenance challenges. And so we're looking forward to where we go from here. Um, a quick few points that I want to make. First, that public safety is our number one priority. SDOT is committed to developing an even more comprehensive and proactive bridge asset preservation program that further maximizes the life of our critical infrastructure in alignment with what the auditor's office has presented. Um, as you know, and as has been said, we've already begun that effort, um, but it wouldn't it comes to maintaining public safety, we always strive to improve. Uh, second, and this is an important point, uh, though the closure of the West Seattle High Rise Bridge on March 23rd of this year um, is what instigated this audit, um, it is actually not the result, the closure is not the result of any deficiency in our bridge maintenance program. In fact, it's to the contrary, uh, because the critical issues with the bridge were identified and addressed as a result of our existing proactive um, and 
thorough bridge inspection program, which had us inspecting that bridge at twice the rate of the federal guidelines. Uh, the third thing I want to say um, is that the most critical challenge we feel we face as we scale, as we work towards this is scaling up the program funding. Uh, the audit includes some helpful process improvements that we will definitely implement to be able to gain a better understanding of where we need to go from here. Uh, but the greatest challenge we have faced and we will continue to face is a sustainable, scalable uh, sources of re revenue um, to develop a more comprehensive asset management program across all of our responsibilities. Uh, and that is a nod to um, other assets that SDOT and roadway structures has to maintain. Last year, we had to implement restrictions on First Avenue and Pioneer Square, for example, for areaways. Um, so that, that story continues. Um, consistent with SDOT's own reporting over the years, the audit does highlight the need for additional funding for bridge maintenance. Um, as, as was noted in the presentation, with a $123 billion backlog of unfunded rehabilitation needs nationwide, Seattle is not alone in this trend. Um, and we are unfortunately in line with almost every other major city in America. Um, while that is a city, state, and federal government wide challenge to resolve, SDOT recognizes the fact that we have important work to do in order to better understand what a fully resourced bridge main, maintenance budget looks like both in terms of total dollars and in terms of scope and uh, staffing resources. Um, and then what it, we need to figure out what it would take for us to build up the capacity. Uh, you know, you've probably heard uh, Director Sam Zimbabwe say that um, even if we had the money today, it takes us time to ramp up the staffing resources to be able to respond to it. So money is not the only piece of the puzzle and, and the work plan that we're looking to develop will reflect that. Um, and as was noted, we concur with nine of the 10 recommendations. The one that we partially concur with is recommendation number two in regards to reimbursable work. Um, with safety as our North Star for all that we do, um, we're grateful this, for this report and the thoughtful suggestions around uh, keeping the traveling public safe um, and responsibly managing the money, but we disagree that the reimbursable work in itself is a problem. Um, the, the challenge is that we are able to maintain more staff uh, with that reimbursable work than we would be able to do with the existing maintenance budget. So it gives us flexibility and uh, more ability to respond to emergencies, training, uh, development, that type of thing. Um, so though the the reallocation of resources to reimbursable is definitely a challenge. It, for right now, with our funding levels, it allows us to keep more staff on board. Um, so that brings us all to, you know, our goal would be to fully fund inspection and maintenance staffing needs um, in the way that we uh, will be able to outline better with this work plan, how we can uh, deliver on our program. Um, and excuse me, I can like stop there for a commenter. moment before I get any questions. Yes, please. Vice Chair Strauss. Thanks, uh, and great to see you, Lorelei. Uh, thank you for all your great work. My question yesterday to the auditors team was actually uh, about slide two or recommendation to the reimbursable work because we know that having a crew that has a high level of expertise performing work for any department is important. It, my question there was, and you, you partially answered this, is it a, an issue that we just need a larger sized crew or should we start having these other departments like City Light to create their own uh, inspection crews? I, I don't have a particular preference. It just seems to me that it does seem like we need to have a higher level of staff. Uh, and then a, a follow up question to that is, is regarding the budgeting. Is it, do we currently have a single line item for bridge maintenance and operations and repair, or is that scattered throughout the budget? Thank you. So I'll answer the second question first. Um, it is, it's in a variety of places in the budget. Some are levy funded, um, some are not. And so uh, the auditor team had to go in and work with our finance team and make sure that they understand understood what pieces they were looking at. Um, but 
you have to look at the full um, details of our maintenance and our rehab and replacement budget to understand all the resources that we have in our roadway structures division to um, maintain our assets. And, and Sean and Jane may have something more to say there uh, too. And Council Member Strauss, your first question around reimbursables, the, what would actually be ideal would be to increase our funding and our staffing resources in the long run, which is what we need to be able to plan out and better uh, explain and present for needs in the future. But I would recommend that even as we make those changes that uh, we would still ideally have enough staff that we could handle some reimbursable work so that we could have the flexibility that comes with that. And by having the reimbursable work part of what we do, um, then we can have a larger staff than we went, might otherwise have if we purely depend on the bridge maintenance budget. Thank you. And we have uh, Calvin Chow from our city council central staff is here. And I know when we when the mayor's budget is transmitted, we'll uh, he, he and we all will be looking carefully at all the bridge maintenance line items to see was there an increase? Are we at least maintaining that level? Uh, please, Calvin. Calvin Chow with Council Central Staff. Uh, thank you, Council Member. I, I think I wanted to just um, underscore something that was in this presentation that um, these bridges are very old, that the median age is 70 years. And so at some point, well, when we talk about maintenance, the, the maintenance need becomes replacement. It becomes a, a much larger project. That's what's happened with Fairview. That, that has been the conversation around Magnolia and other bridges. Um, Council member Herbold asked about the Move Seattle levy, which uh, expires at the end of 2024. And it established three categories for that spending of the levy money, including 420 million for maintenance and repair. And there is some uh, uh, authorization to be able to move things slightly within 10% uh, with um, comment from the Move Seattle Oversight Committee and future council action. But largely there's a, there's a whole Obviously, there's a whole series of commitments that have been made uh, with the Move Seattle levy. The next real opportunity for elected officials to consider what we do on a bigger scale with, with significant amounts of money will be when the Move Seattle levy comes up for renewal. Um, that conversation will be for elected officials in 2023. And so it may be about thinking about what can we do in the time between to set up that conversation, to have better information, to look at our broad range of assets and be able to put something before voters um, to start to address some of these needs. So I, I think there are sort of near-term issues that would be appropriate for our budget cycle and, and how we uh, deal with sort of the um, regular maintenance, but this is big dollar items as well. And we probably need to think about it in, in two different scales. Thank you. Um, can we hear a final word? Um, Lorelai Williams, are you are you finished from SDOT or can we move to the auditor and just wrap it up? I there were a few other questions that were asked, but if we want to, uh, so I can oh, grab those really thanks. quick. Calvin got the move Seattle one um, and handled it very well, so nothing more there. Um, just a note in terms of uh, the uh, private infrastructure that we inspect. One of the things we have noted is we could hire outside resources to do those inspections also rather than drawing from our team. So I wanted to call attention to that. Um, also uh, make sure that you all were aware that we last year created roadway structures as its own division, particularly in response to understanding the growing maintenance needs and needing to elevate that within our organization. Um, and then there was a question about the bridge load rating uh, program and what that looks like going forward with the changes from the federal government. I was going to call on Matt Donahue just really quickly to respond to that. Thanks, Lorelai. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Donahue. I'm the interim director for roadway structures. And I think uh, perhaps what council member Herbold was referring to is the um, mandate from the FHWA, the Federal Highway Administration that dictated that all owners of certain types of bridges on the national highway system have to load rate their bridges for two new uh, commercial vehicles that were introduced into the federal system uh, emergency vehicles and special haul vehicles which are very uh, large multi-axle dump trucks for heavy construction and so that resulted in us um, starting a program that's due in 2022 
that we load rate 69 of our bridges for those two specific trucks. Councilmember Peterson, I think that oh. wraps up everything I had notes about. Thank, thank you, Lorelei. Councilmember Herbal. So um, again, my I think my question though is is for the for the bridges that you have done <clears throat> load level uh, new load level ratings for, um, uh, I, I understand it's they're not they're not all due until 2022, um, but uh, I my recollection is that this uh regulatory change was back in um i think it was like 2014 2015. 2015 um right. and although folks although the cities were given a long time to com complete all of the load level rating of all of the uh the eligible bridges um and th there's there's an expect expectation that we don't just wait until 2022 and do them all <laughs> at, at 2022 that we that we phase phase the work in mm -hmm. and I, I guess my question is is for those bridges that the work has already been completed um has has the city auditor um looked at those new um those new load level ratings as part of um the city audit on bridges and come to any conclusions um, about something that we should be doing differently with those bridges that have um, have already had this work done, these new ratings. Because you know, as we know, this is this is what sort of triggered, um, uh, um, in some ways, uh, greater scrutiny on on the West Seattle Bridge. And so I'm just wondering uh, if if we went through that same exercise with other bridges. Uh, for which um, we've done the new load level ratings on, um, would we come to conclusions um, about other fair bridges that are rated fair that need some extra attention? I think, uh, so a couple things in the audit and Sean, please chime in or Jane, um, load rating was considered in, the, in respect to the budget. If you look at bridge the bridge maintenance budget, it's comprised of four components, two that are out of the general fund and two that are out of capital. Uh, the two out of capital are our load rating program and our bridge painting program. So they consider the budget specifically for our load rating program. I think when I hear what you're saying, um, load rating assessments are to look at bridge components specifically for a truck type. And all it does is say, will the bridge handle the load from that particular vehicle type or not? It's not really an assessment of the condition of the bridge by component or overall. And I think the audit recommendation about getting down to a bridge preservation program that's at the component by component level, rather than just using the overall sufficiency rating for the bridge, which is what we do now, it speaks maybe more to what you're asking for that we can, even if the overall rating for a bridge is at a fair level, we can identify specific components that need to be addressed, even though the bridge itself overall is considered fair. That's helpful, and I might have more uh, refinement of my um, not very well stated question as a follow up. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, Vice Chair Strauss. Oh, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, and Matt, if you could stay on the line, your last comment was something that was also brought up by Eugene Wasserman during public comment today regarding the Ballard Bridge. As I was traveling into City Hall today, uh, it was just after 9 a.m. and I noticed that the Ballard Bridge was up, which is outside of our typical, usually the bridge does not open at, I guess it is after nine that it, it Never mind. let me retract that statement. I, all that to say is I was worried that the bridge was stuck up and I took the Fremont Bridge instead. And that is because of that ball bearing um, and some of the component level issues. Uh, and I just appreciate you calling that out and flag for the committee the importance that we look at the component by component issues. Um, Lorelai, I also just wanted to follow up with you regarding the private bridge inspection. It is my understanding that we as the city charge uh, the owners of these private bridges for the inspections. Is, is that correct? Is that a correct understanding? That is correct. And I think the like second paragraph of that ordinance that was on the screen talks about how we're able to charge them for that, which is which is why it could be even more directly easy to acquire consultants to fill that void. 
Um, yeah, definitely. And uh, one more thing, just because it came up, the we are SDOT's working right now on our transportation asset management plan and the update for that. And so just to your point from earlier, Lorelai, is that with the reimbursable work and with this work that can be either with private bridges where the funding is not necessarily the issue, it is that we as a city need to take a stronger look at the crew levels that we're able to provide you SDOT and the residents of Seattle. Just flagging that for the record. Thank you. Thank you, council members, and thank you um, folks from SDOT and from the city auditor. I really appreciate this work. We're going to, you know, the city auditor, as David G. Jones mentioned, uh, they will be back. They will be following up on these recommendations. Uh, council members, if you do have additional questions for them that you want to address, uh, we will have them back at our committee. Um, they actually were able to do so much more work in, in this period of time than we had been expecting. We were hoping to get this uh, a preliminary report prior to the mayor transmitting her budget so it can inform our analysis. So we could, might be helpful to the executive branch as they finalize their budget transmittal to us and then inform us when we decide how to amend the budget. Uh, but they were able to get a lot more work done in advance. Um, and uh, that was thanks uh, a lot to SDOT as well. But we will still hear from them again as a follow up. So send any questions you have to them. Um, uh, Auditor Jones, any final words before we move on? I'll defer to the team uh, that did the work. I don't know if Sean or Jane had anything they want to add. I would just put out there that this is a very um, expensive and complicated problem. Um, and the consequences of not doing anything are pretty severe. And I think that um, we're, the good news story is that you have SDOT very interested in doing this work and then also the attention that you all are giving it. So um, we're hoping that with our recommendations that it'll help put us in a better place. Thank you very much. And once again, it's the collaboration between the executive branch and the legislative branch is greatly appreciated here. All right, well, let's thank you, everybody. Uh, let's move on to the next item. Item three on our agenda today is a council bill. Uh, will the clerk please read item three into the record? Okay, while well, folks, uh, presenters are getting themselves ready, Council Bill 119870, an ordinance relating to the City Light Department authorizing the general manager and CEO to execute a 10 year agreement with Ponderay County for loss of revenues and additional financial burdens associated with the City Light Department's operation of the Boundary Hydroelectric Project on the Ponderay River, pursuant to RCW 3521420, 3521425, and 3541427, and ratifying and confirming certain prior acts. Thank you. And we do have with us the CEO and general manager of Seattle City Light and her team. Uh, we also have our central staff, Eric McConaughey. Um, Eric, did you want to say anything to introduce this or should we just hand it over to Deborah Smith? I think it's fine just to jump right in and I'm here for uh, any questions should you uh, like to ask, uh, especially if there's something to follow up that I can work with the department on later. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so general manager and CEO, we need to come up with an abbreviated I know we can just title, go, so. we can just go with general manager that works okay. for me. So thank you for the opportunity to be here, Council Member Peterson and members of the committee. Um, it feels really good to be back, I guess, even though it, it's it's a slightly different way, but it feels good to be picking up work um, and moving forward. And so we'll be bringing items to you today, and then I think uh, uh, next week as well. So um, uh, great to be here, and great to see you, Eric. Call out there, thank you. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce the team because we have four items and while I know that they'll be introduced individually, we'll go ahead and do the intros all at once. So again, I'm John Deborah Smith, Deborah Smith, General Manager of Seattle City Light. On the first two items that we'll be reviewing with you today, we have Mike Haynes, who's our Chief Operating Officer, and Jeff Wolf, who's our Legal Affairs Advisor. And then we will switch directions and you will, uh, we will talk about uh, green up and net metering 
and we will have Craig Smith, who's our chief customer officer, and Lori Moen, who's the manager of solutions design and management. So um, again, uh, these are all fairly, um, uh, well, maybe not routine, but they are, they are um, tactical kinds of issues. Uh, when we come before you next, we will talk about some of our more uh, uh, far reaching, the transportation electrification strategic investment plan. And, and that's uh, a more forward looking piece of work, but these are important pieces. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike Haynes. Thanks, Deborah, and good morning, committee. Good morning, Ch Council, Council Chair. Um, Mike Haynes, Chief Operating Officer. Um, so this first uh, presentation is specific to the Boundary Project in Northeast Washington State. So more if you can advance the slide. Um, <clears throat> this uh, constitutes a renewal of an existing 10-year agreement that expired at the end of 2019. Uh, I, as long as I've been here, we've been negotiating these on about 10-year cycles. Um, we have a similar agreement with Whatcom County, just to put it in the context for the Skagit River project, and that'll be coming, coming due in a couple of years time. So the <clears throat> context is what it is in this uh, first slide. It gives you the authority from the state to require us to pay what we call impact fees to counties outside of our jurisdiction where we operate a hydroelectric plant. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, within the context of uh, this particular agreement that we've negotiated with Ponderay County, the city um, is obligated, uh, according to the ordinance, because of our population, um, because we own and operate a public utility, and because we built a hydroelectric project outside of our county of origin. Um, and this written agreement requires continued payments by state law, even though the current agreement has expired, for instance, uh, we continue to pay uh, the currently to the county based on the terms of the agreement that expired last year. And that's that was built into the state RCW. So next slide, please. Uh, the next, um, the reason why we do this and the reason that is embodied into the RCW is, is in front of you. Um, these elements, public peace, health, safety, welfare, um, all components of uh, impacts that are <coughs> highlighted um, in the context of constructing a major hydro project in, in, a, in a county on a river system. Uh, one of the things I wanted to highlight is, is road maintenance. We, uh, we do uh, take that part very seriously and that was one of the major components uh, contributing to the current uh, renewal and the negotiations that took place uh, late last year and earlier this year. Um, so this essentially is the basis for the dollars. Um, and uh, going forward, the county will take those dollars and distribute them according to uh, the construct in the agreement. So next slide, please. A uh, little bit more context. Um, arbitration is a clause within the RCW. We did not have to go that route because negotiations were successful. The county, uh, myself and Deborah came to agreement and um, uh, all parties are, are in agreement with the terms that we came up with. And as I mentioned earlier, this agreement replaces one that expired last year. Um, we would anticipate being back here in about uh, nine years time uh, to uh, present the next 10 year agreement. So next slide. This slide just highlights the order of magnitude of <clears throat> the dollars that are in play for the county. The county uh, gets these disbursements and quarterly payments that come in out of our, our light fund. And, um, and then the county then disperses those payments according to provisions in the agreement. So next slide, please. The agreement identifies that the county is the keeper of the funds and also the disbursement authority. Uh, there's three towns in the context or in, in, I guess, in close proximity to our boundary project, the town of Medellin, Medellin Falls, and Ione. So they, by formula, get a portion of these funds uh, distributed to them for their general funds. And uh, associated with that, two, two, uh, three school districts that uh, get appropriations based on county formula. <coughs> uh, the three school districts, uh, Selkirk, Cusick, and Newport. Uh, just as a point of information, the Selkirk School District, uh, if we have school age kids that um, are children of city employees that work at Boundary, more than likely they are attending the Selkirk School District. That's the North County uh, area. And then um, 
Yeah, so that last bullet just affirms that the county does the fund uh, disbursements. So that was pretty quick. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. Council members, any questions for Seattle City Light on this council bill? Okay. Then we will go ahead. I don't see any questions from uh, my colleagues here. So uh, council member Strauss, please. Thanks, Chair Peterson. Just to say that meeting with Seattle City Light yesterday uh, and General Manager Smith, your uh, team is just so excellent. They were able to answer all of my questions. This is very routine and, and uh, standard piece of legislation. So thanks to everyone for making this happen. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. So council members at this time, I'd like to move that the committee recommend passage of council bill 119870. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to recommend passage of this bill. Uh, any final comments? Okay. Will the clerk please call the roll on the committee recommendation that we pass this bill? Gonzalez. Aye. Herbold. Aye. Morales. Aye. Strauss. Yes. Chair Peterson. Yes. Five yes, no no's. The motion carries and the committee recommendation that this bill pass will be sent to the September 21st city council meeting. Thank you presenters and we'll move into item four on the agenda. Uh, will the clerk please call the or please read the item four into the agenda? Council Bill 119857, an ordinance relating to the City Light Department, clarifying that residents living in the City Light Department owned housing in the Diablo and New Halem communities are subject to the City Light Department's rates under Chapter 2149 and 2156 of the Seattle Municipal Code, amending section 2156.030 of the Seattle Municipal Code and ratifying and confirming certain prior acts. Thank you, General Manager Smith. Thank you, Council Member Peterson. Uh, uh, not going to do additional uh, intros. This, is, this truly is a fairly uh, perfunctory housekeeping type of item. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mike Haynes again. Thanks very much, Deborah. Thank you, Council Chair. Um, next slide, Maura, please. So the history of this goes way back in time, uh, even before my time here at City Light. Uh, we own 44 houses up in the towns of New Hamel, Halem and Diablo, up in the North Cascades, the foothill to the American Alps, as they say. Um, we have a few, a few central employees that receive utilities as part of either a collective bargaining agreement or through uh, offers because of their uh, essential capacity with the city and their, their desire to live in our company town. Other employees who uh, work uh, and live in the New Halem and Diablo area actually sign rental agreements that uh, require them to pay both rent and utilities. Next slide, please. So the language that we're, we're uh, updating at the um, recommendation of the city law department um, is in front of you now. The SMC uh, hasn't been changed in, in a very long time. I believe this language dates back into the 70s. And so this is an opportunity to clear up some uh, ambiguities and also uh, clear up any confusion for new renters and for existing renters who are under our current lease agreements. So next slide. Uh, then looks at the proposed amended language and the uh, revised language for the SMC, um, which makes it very explicit that um, City Light employees living in company housing will uh, pay utilities. Uh, so that is the gist of this update. Um, next slide, please. So um, this just kind of uh, summarizes what the code application does. It requires people living in the towns, living for or working for the city to pay electric rates uh, similar to all city residences. Uh, and I mentioned earlier that some, some rental agreements explicitly require, or our rental agreements do explicitly require this. Um, 
there has been some uh, confusion and misinterpretation of this over the years that we've had to uh, clear up on a case by case basis. And again, uh, the law department has been uh, recommending this for, for some time and I'm glad we're finally bringing it to, to the table today. So next slide. So the impact is that again, it clarifies that employees when they sign rental agreements, they will be paying utilities. This doesn't impact any of the current employees existing arrangements, whether it's by labor agreement or hiring, uh, hiring letters. Uh, those agreements stand. This language is, is uh, again, clearing up what's in, what's been the practice for a very long time up at Skagit and then also uh, makes it very clean for new renters coming in and new, new employees who want to rent housing with what the terms and conditions will look like that are uh, embedded into the rental agreements. So that uh, again was very fast. I'm happy to take questions, council member, council chair. Thank you, council members. Any questions on this particular council bill or the presentation? Council member Strauss. Thank you, Chair Peterson. Just again, flagging from my meeting yesterday with Seattle City Light, it is clear that this is just an update to clarify and make consistent uh, what could be confusing language and this is well received. Thank you for making this happen. Thank you, council member Strauss. Well, council members, if no further questions on this item, I would like to move that the committee recommend passage of Council Bill 119857. Is there a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any final comments or questions? Great. So we'll have the clerk please call the roll on the committee recommendation that this bill pass. Gonzalez. Aye. Herbold. Aye. Morales. Aye. Strauss. Yes. Chair Peterson. Yes. Five yes, no nays. All right, the motion carries and the committee recommendation that the bill pass will be sent to the September 21st city council meeting. Now we're gonna move into the, set, the uh, third city light item, which is item five on our agenda, Council Bill 119871. Uh, will the clerk please write, read item five into the record? Council Bill 119871, an ordinance relating to the City Light Department establishing updated eligibility requirements for net metering and customer requested net metering aggregation billing arrangements and amending section 214982 of the Seattle Municipal Code. Thank you. We have another short presentation by City Light. Um, General Manager Smith, take it away. Thank you. Thanks again, Council Member Peterson. Yes, yeah, so the next two items are. Uh, are both uh, related to provisions and offerings from our customer energy solutions group. So uh, up first is the, the net metering ordinance, which is a technical fix as well. Um, and I will turn it over to Lori Moen uh, for a presentation. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Deborah. And good morning, council members. Thank you for having us this morning. Um, next slide, please, Maura. So um, we've been involved in renewable energy for a long time at City Light, and we have a whole suite of renewable energy programs. This specific request today is to align our current Seattle ordinance to the state Seattle ordinance, but it gives me an opportunity to provide some context about our, the current state of solar in our service territory. So we have offered net metering since it was um, required by the state in uh, the late 1990s and with um, adoption of an SMC in 2000. Over the years, the um, requirements for uh, net metering have changed. Initially, uh, utilities were asked to, to have a cap of 0.1% of their 1996 demand uh, for City Light that met 10 megawatts and we hit 10 megawatts and kept going. That is. Uh, the state only required us to meet their cap, but we as a, as a municipal utility allowed uh, additional customers to continue to get uh, net metering under our um, own umbrella. 
Today, the cap for net metering is 4% of the 1996 peak demand. Uh, for City Light, that represents 78 megawatts of solar. Uh, our current total is 41% of that. We have um, currently 32 megawatts of solar connected. That's uh, 26 megawatts in the residential sector and six megawatts in the commercial sector. Uh, so we're doing quite well and I'll just take an opportunity to speak to the ways that uh, we do support uh, solar and other renewable energy projects across all of our portfolio. So in addition to net metering, we have recently added um, the option to aggregate and I'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. But um, in addition to an aggregation option, we're looking to um, pilot a virtual net metering option in affordable housing. And what that allows is for um, one system to credit multiple customer bills, uh, which would be the case, a great case uh, to enable solar on a multifamily building. Um, we last year we adopted a large solar program which created a clear process and a purchase rate for our customers who wanted to install a larger solar array uh, that would be anything that exceeded 100 kw up to two megawatts um, we also um, work with the department of construction and inspections very closely on the seattle energy code uh, the code has a current solar ready requirement for multifamily buildings over three stories and commercial uh, <clears throat> and the new code, which uh, will go into effect and is currently go into effect in um, February and is currently under review, um, is taking that one step further to require um, solar installed at the time of construction for these same buildings. Relative to residential, there's no firm requirement right now for solar, but uh, builders have to choose certain energy efficiency options and solar is one of those options that they can choose from in order to meet code requirements. And, and finally, I'll just talk a little bit about our, our voluntary green power programs, which uh, is the second item that I'm going to be presenting on. But that again is a, a two decade long effort by Seattle City Light to promote renewable energy in our community. and. Uh, what started out as a demonstration program led to over 30 projects uh, in our community that demonstrate renewable energy. And the current Green Up program uh, is, is um, supporting uh, actual project development in local schools, community centers, nonprofits, and current focus is on affordable housing. So across all of our programs, we've, we've really supported um, net metering and solar um, for quite some time. So the purpose of this request is basically to align the Seattle code with the state code. And there are two simple changes. Uh, the first change is relative to how we account for solar energy. In net metering, customers generate power with their solar cells. And if, if uh, they can consume it internal to the house, they get retail rate. If they generate more than their home is consuming, that gets exported and under a net metering agreement, it gets put in a bank. And so they bank all summer long and in the winter they'll pull from that bank and then the bank is cleared out at a point in time. Previously that point in time had been April 30th. The RCW has changed that to March 31st, which gives customers another month to acquire solar, assuming that we'll get some solar generation in April that they can pull from in the winter time. So great benefit, small change. The second piece that the RCW allows for is utilities can recover the administrative costs of allowing net meter aggregation. Aggregation is when you have a customer who owns more than one solar array on adjacent properties. So for example, if you've got a large garage on a parcel and your home next door on a parcel and you have two meters and two uh, solar arrays, you can now combine those two so that your home can benefit from the generation on the garage. And, and that has required us to make some changes in our billing system. So uh, utilities are now allowed to recover those costs. And what Seattle City Light would do, would like to do is um, provide a one-time setup fee to do that. Um, uh, aggregation in our system. Thank you. We've got a question from or comment from Councilmember Strauss. 
Thank you, Chair Peterson, and thank you, Lori. You actually answered my one of my questions, which is, is this a one-time fee? Is it nominal uh, in order to cover the basic administrative costs that you are incurring? Um, I know that it is, we have the ability to make it a more, an annual fee, and I, I just register that I appreciate you making this a one-time fee. Um, my other question that I wanted to tease out, it sounded like the most important benefit from this aggregation is that as it currently stands, if you have solar on your garage and solar on your home, your net benefit from your garage could only be used on your garage. And this change would allow that uh, energy generation from your garage to also be used on your home. Is, is that a correct understanding? Yes, it is. And with rooftop solar, of course, your generation generation is limited to the rooftop size. And so that would allow for people to um, have a system that's more uh, in line with what their what their home energy consumption might be. And Thank just you. for a fact, we we have two people who have uh, taken up this option. So uh, not not a high demand, not a, a Black Friday rush to, to take advantage of it. But I suspect over time we'll get more customers. All right, Council then the oh, excuse me, Councilmember Herbal. Thanks. Um, I maybe I should have waited um, to see the rest of the presentation, but um, I recently had a constituent contact me um, about the fact that um, they um, were producing uh, more energy than um, they needed, um, both. Uh, including including for the period of time where they you would bank the energy the excess energy so they didn't they didn't need to use all the excess energy in the in the winter months mm -hmm. um and um my recollection was that seattle city lights response to that issue is that their practice is that they don't they don't we don't pay customers for overproducing uh, energy um I'm, I'm assuming that's still the case even um, with this proposal before us today. But if that particular individual had another structure, um, perhaps I could contact that constituent and find out if, he ha if there's another structure um, and they, if they want to apply um, what's in their bank towards um, the costs associated with, with energy and that other structure. But, but I mostly just want to confirm that the policy is going to remain um, that we are not going to pay customers for overproducing energy beyond um, their ability to use it uh, when they banked it. That is correct. And, and we feel that the, um, the change to the solar year will actually benefit those individuals who, who um, end the year with without anything left in their bank. So we have very few customers who have a bank at the end of the year and that gets dissolved back to the utility. Um, so there is no cash out at the end of the year. That's correct. Thank you. Please continue. All right, so this last slide basically says that um, it will um, edit the municipal code. And as a result of that edit, we don't expect any budgetary impacts um, from either item and uh, so very, very minor impacts. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. Any uh, final questions from council members before we vote on item five on our agenda? All right, council members, I move that the committee recommend passage of council bill 119871. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded to recommend passage of this bill. Any final comments? All right. Will the clerk please call the roll on the committee recommendation that we pass this bill? Gonzalez. Aye. Herbold. Aye. Morales. Aye. Strauss. Yes. Chair Peterson. Aye. Five eyes, no nays.
The motion carries and the committee recommendation that the bill pass will be sent to the September 21st city council meeting. Colleagues, we just have two more items, another council or two more council bills, uh, one from Seattle City Light and then the one at the end from SDOT. So item six on our agenda now, will the, please, will the clerk please read this item into the record. Council Bill 119885, an ordinance relating to the City Light Department amending Section 214984 of the Seattle Municipal Code to enable a broader suite of voluntary renewable energy program options to City Light customers. Thank you, General Manager Smith. Oh, you're on mute, General Manager. All right, thank you. Um, appreciate that. And uh, again, this is a this is a, a another uh, small, relatively small piece of legislation, but it will give us increased flexibility and allow us to be more responsive to our customers. Lori will again be presenting, but before I turn it over to her, I did just want to check in and see if if Craig Smith, our Chief Customer Officer, had anything he wanted to say since he is on the call. And he is silent, so I will take silence as uh, permission to move forward and turn this over to Lori yet again. And by the way, uh, council members, I really, really appreciate you all hanging in there with us. I know that we're running a bit late, and so we're very, very thankful that you've all that you all carved out, carved out the time and then been able to stay. Thank you, Lori. All right. Well. Um Voluntary green power purchase is another one of our suite of renewable energy programs. And this is a really fun program because as you all know, Seattle City Light is green power. And we've had our long history of hydroelectricity and since 2005, we've been carbon neutral. So these programs allow our customers to go beyond what we already provide them with and support the growth of renewable energy in our local uh, communities. And in some cases, they result in some beautiful artwork, which I think you're probably all familiar with the sonic bloom. Um, so go ahead and pre present the next slide. Um, again, this is a, a two decade long journey that we've had for renewable energy. Uh, started off with some requirements again by the Washington, by the state of Washington to um, require utilities to offer a voluntary program to purchase qualified alternative energy resources. The first program that we initiated actually took the qualified alternative alternative energy resources component and added a, another element which was demonstration projects and while customers would subscribe to purchase a qualified alternative energy resource which again was additive above and beyond what they would get from their electric bill and kilowatt hours supplied by city light um, dollars would go to buy qualified alternative energy resources and also invest in demonstration projects and you've probably seen one of these projects somewhere throughout the city. Um, like I showed in the first slide, one of the most famous ones is Sonic Bloom. Uh, another uh, reputable one is the uh, solar installation on the carousel at the zoo. So that program, because it had the demonstration project component in it, actually closed in 2011 because a secondary program had been adopted to clearly um, allocate, um, cust give customers the opportunity to buy renewable energy credits. So second slide, please. So GreenUp was established in 2005, and that was intended to be a very straightforward and simple way for customers to purchase qualified renewable energy credits more aligned with the market rate. And again, additionality, uh, but they could they could um, provide feedback on what portfolio of renewable energy they would like to purchase. We had a we have a very simple formula. It's a, a three six nine dollar contribution on a residential bill, and for commercial customers, it can be a little bit more um, creative and flexible. And so we've operated this program since 2005. And during the time when we had the authority to do some creative things, we continued to invest in those demonstration projects. In 2011, when the Green Power uh, 
purchase program ended and GreenUp was our sole program, we now had to line all of our program spending to purchasing renewable energy credits, which are, uh, in order to be a qualified rec, you have to go through a few hoops and there's a certification body, um, usually not uh, closely aligned to smaller projects. But despite that, this program has really supported a number, as I, as I said in my original pre presentation, it supported a number of uh, local renewable projects in schools. We, do, we have done seven schools with the Seattle Public, Public School District. Um, we are working, um, we have funded uh, Harborview and um, the Pacific Science Center as community spaces and nonprofits. And currently the program is working with affordable housing as our focus. We've got uh, four projects identified in new construction on an exemplary buildings demonstration pilot and an additional um, eight projects in the affordable housing sector. And all of these projects will be uh, the purchase of their renewable energy credits, which actually, actually occur once the projects are up and running. So as we've talked to customers and we've looked at their interest in funding renewable energy in our community, there, there is an interest to go back to a place where it's not just a renewable energy credit that they're purchasing, but more of a direct funding of some of these um, local projects and in particular funding affordable uh, projects on affordable housing. So the proposed changes that we have are really to allow some flexibility. The first thing is that the municipal code uses the term green up as a product and we feel that that's really branded to the renewable energy credits. Um, so we'd like to remove that from the ordinance. And the second piece is that we would like to add a section to the ordinance, not taking away from anything that currently exists, but that allows us to offer a product that doesn't align with a qualified alternative resource. And, and these products would still be permitted under our rules and regulations. They would comply with all, all of our net metering and aggregation program requirements, uh, but they would allow for customers to opt in to funding uh, things that are a little bit more creative and flexible. And in particular, we, we really perceive um, a focus here on um, providing solar in uh, low income communities and affordable housing. Next slide. So once again, um, these programs are fully funded by voluntary contributions. Customers select their level of participation. Um, that participation rate is is around 14,000 customers a year. It's been very steady. We've got a lot of customers who are, who are very outspoken in this area and very interested in supporting the community. So again, um, no financial impacts to these changes. Councilmember Strauss. Thanks, Chair Peterson, and thanks, Lori. If you could uh, switch back to slides three and four I just wanted to hear a little bit more. I understand that when we are ensuring that the correct voltage is on our um, network to be able to provide electricity to all of the, to have the correct load for our network, that sometimes we have to make blind purchases of electricity on the market, which in turn means that we are purchasing dirty uh, electricity from carbon polluting uh, sources and that City Light does such an excellent job of offsetting these carbon purchases by, or by purchasing carbon credits to offset these blind purchases. Can you share with us how that ability for us to keep City Light carbon neutral is different and separate from this Green Up program? Yeah, we actually have an individual who oversees our carbon neutrality program, and I believe that's part of our integrated resource plan. Um, those are wholesale market purchases at bulk levels. Um, the purchases that we make through the Green Up program are roughly 26 megawatts a year, um, so nowhere near what we might be uh, purchasing for the city light um, system requirements. So they're, they're two separate programs, and they may buy Re renewable energy credits from the same projects, 
um, but they are they are um, the recs that we purchase from the the uh, for the renewable energy program uh, is customer driven. It's all based on customer funds. It's not rate payer uh, rate based. Thanks. So the, what you're saying is that this is, and I think you said this during the presentation. I guess I'm just calling it out that this is an additional fee or charge that a customer is voluntarily paying so that we are able to create a more green electrical network is is, is that correct so it's a the customer is opting into an additional fee so that we have a green network they are opting into an additional fee to support renewable energy in our region and also in our local community they don't expect this kilowatt to come to their home Excellent. And, and Craig or Mike can can uh, yeah. chime in here if they'd like to add perspective. Yeah. I'm having trouble with my um, council member. So the, the programs are, are two really distinct programs. Again, this program today we're talking about is funded by customers and this additional flexibility is consistent with what a lot of utilities do. Um, I worked at eWeb in Eugene for a long time and eWeb's customers have the ability similarly to sign up and then they actually vote on projects that they want to fund. So everyone who participates in the program gets to vote on community projects uh, that, that, that um, allow generally nonprofits or um, schools, et cetera, to, um, to install infrastructure they perhaps wouldn't otherwise be able to do. The Greenhouse Gas Neutrality Program, which is actually managed out of our environmental group, and we actually go out and we purchase credits, their projects. So it's it's really not it's not a rec per se. It's more uh, in order to in order to get credit for greening, you're literally having to invest monies um, in green resources that or projects that would otherwise perhaps not be done. So again, it's the same concept. You are greening um, uh, and offsetting any carbon impact. Or the resources that you're procuring to serve load and you're doing that with um, specific projects that bring value to the larger region um, and those are uh, those are funds that are budgeted each year and they are embedded and they are part of the revenue requirement that that we use to set rates thank you that is helpful clarification and distinction and i'd like the record to reflect that for the second time in the last 30 days we are taking public policy uh, direction from the city of eugene oregon who is a bastion for good public policy thank you my apologies chair i did have uh, one second question on slide four There we go. And Lori, can you share with us if we are not using the uh, RCW determined qualifi qualifications for new programs? Can you share? You mentioned a little bit about where some of the metrics are that you're using to identify what qualifies a project. Can you just clearly um, share with us what qualifications are we using to determine uh, which programs are eligible? Well, there is a definition in the RCW that defines a qualified project and everything we do normally fits under that definition. Um, what is different is that we're not engaging a certifying body to certify that the pro projects qualify. Um, that is an administrative burden when you're doing something like a, a, so a small 10 kW solar project on an affordable housing. Um, to go through the project uh, requirements to become uh, certified by Regis uh, is where the burden is. And so these projects will be fully qualified as renewable energy projects through all of our codes and inspections and va validations. And the kilowatt hours will be tracked in our system and accounted for as we would any other project. The, the only difference is that we're not engaging a third party to um, walk through procedures to qualify them. Thank you, very helpful. All right, let's wrap this one up. Okay, 
we're at the end of the presentation. Thank you. And thanks for the questions, council members. Any final questions before we take this to a vote? All right, council members, I move that the committee recommend passage of council bill 119885. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to recommend passage of this bill. Any final comments? All right, will the clerk please call the roll on the committee recommendation that we pass this bill? Gonzalez. Aye. Herbold. Aye. Morales. Strauss. Yes. Chair Peterson. Yes. Uh, Morales. Uh, Aye. Thank I'm you. Sorry about that. That's all right. Five Aye. yes. No no's. The motion carries and the committee recommendation that the bill pass will be sent to the September 21st City Council Committee. Thanks everybody from Seattle City Light. It's good seeing you as always. Uh, council members, we've got one last item here, which is item seven or, yes, we've got, we've got one last item here. So <laughs> will the clerk please call uh, read this item into the record? Yes, it is item seven. Uh, Council Bill 119883, an ordinance amending Ordinance 126000, which adopted the 2020 budget, including the 2020 to 2025 Capital Improvement Program, the CIP, revising project allocations for the Madison BRT, Bus Rapid Transit, Rapid Ride G Line project, and certain other projects in ordinance 126000 into the 2020 to 2025 adopted CIP and ratifying and confirming certain prior acts. Thank you. Our Seattle Department of Transportation is back for this item about the uh, Madison bus rapid ride. Um, so is it Lorelei Williams, will you start us off or Eric? Yes, I'll get us started. Sean is going to get the presentation loaded. Um, so as Toby said, uh, we're here to talk about, uh, we actually have, we have some good news today. Um, we're here to talk about the Madison BRT Rapid G Line. Um, and we're here today in final preparations for uh, receiving a small starts grant from the federal government. And um, from there, I'll get into the details. Uh, next slide. So we'll go through project background just to set the stage. We'll uh, review the schedule and then get right to the CIP amendment proposal, which is why we're here today, and then follow up with any questions. Um, and then as we usually do, uh, our mission, vision, and core values. Um, obviously this project uh, addresses equity, safety, mobility, sustainability, livability, and excellence. So we're hitting on all counts with the Madison BRT project. Next slide. So purpose and need. Uh, so this bus rapid transit project that also includes uh, quite a bit of capital improvement along the line that you see, they're highlighted in blue. Um, it will provide fast, frequent and reliable service uh, from First Avenue and downtown uh, through the Madison Valley. Um, it will serve neighborhoods that are experiencing rapid growth and are also historically underserved. And then as noted, it will connect riders um, to dozens of other bus routes, the light rail, uh, First Hill Streetcar and ferry services at the Coleman Dock. And I'm here, I'm gonna pass it on to Eric Twite, who is the project manager to get into the details. Okay, so this is one of the premier uh, rapid ride projects coming out of Move Seattle and a partnership with King County Metro. Um, they will be operating it as Rapid Ride G, and it has all the key features of their rec Rapid Ride program. Buses will be frequent um, throughout the day, operating, um, arriving every six minutes during the day, and on, including Monday through Saturday, and 15 minutes in the evenings and on Sundays. There will be raised platforms and off-board fare payment to make loading faster and easier. Um, between I-5 and 12th Avenue, uh, the uh, platforms and the lanes, the buses will be running on the inside lanes, so they have more um, or less uh, uh, interaction with other traffic, improving their overall transit time. So the travel time for the buses is expected to increase or improve, I should say, by about 35%, going down 
uh, to seven and a half minutes in the westbound direction during the PM peak period. Um, and finally, the project also includes improvements to access and safety for pedestrians and bicyclists. The image on the lower right part of the slide shows the intersection of Union and 12th Avenue and Madison, where we are making improvements to uh, for pedestrians crossing through this intersection and accessing the uh, station there, as well as uh, carrying bikes through a protected section through that intersection connecting to the uh, Union PBL that were under construction this year. Next slide. Next slide. The project also includes enhancements for our utilities. There will be a new water main installed uh, west, or I'm sorry, east of Broadway, a new sewer main as well, east of Broadway, and City of Light is uh, constructing with this project street light improvements in the first hill area. So a little bit of background, um, uh, getting to where we are. The city uh, council approved the locally preferred alternative in 2016. And this project was approved for entry into the FDA's um, small starts program as well uh, later in 2016. We completed our environmental assessment, a documented categorical exclusion and approved by FDA at the end of 2017. Um, Last year, the, P the FTA assigned a project management oversight consultant or PMOC to this project. That is part of their standard approach for their capital investments grants programs projects, including small starts to uh, go through this oversight process. Their consultant looks at our overall risks, our capacity and our capabilities to deliver the projects to ensure for FTA that the funds that they're giving us are going to be used wisely and complete the project. We did receive some input in November. They completed a risk assessment and uh, their initial assessment of our overall capacity and had some recommendations, including a recommendation to increase our overall risks, uh, uh, I'm sorry, contingency consistent with FTA requirements. We also updated our project management plan in response to their recommendations including adding the full staffing plan for construction and some of the other sub plans that really build off our current practices and needed to be documented. So at the end of June, the PMOC issued their final readiness report to FTA. And that report concluded that SDOT does have the, um, the resources and capacity to plan, develop, manage, and complete the, the um, Madison BRT project as well. Um, they confirmed that we had addressed all of their other findings. The PMOC did identify a few things that we need to complete before we go into a small starts grant and they are um, gonna be addressed by Lorelei on the next slide. All right, so our next steps um, are our local funding commitment and the amendment to the CIP, which is what we're here to talk about today. And that amendment incorporates that additional contingency that came out of the process with the FTA's PMOC. Um, the ST3 package uh, that was approved by voters in 2016 includes funding for Madison BRT, which is the second item you see here. Uh, a funding agreement with Sound Transit is ready and waiting for action by the Sound Transit Board. It is now included in their larger assessment of cash flow and funding decisions affected by COVID-19. Um, Mayor Durkin and actually now our Levy Oversight Committee have uh, contacted Sound Transit and uh, urged them to move uh, this agreement forward as soon as possible as uh, after an anticipation of receiving the amendment to the CIP with uh, Council, the Sound Transit funding agreement will be the only thing that remains. Um, so once those two steps are complete, then FTA will prepare their small starts grant agreement. Um, we are targeting and have been targeting the end of the year uh, for executing the small starts grant agreement, um, though we are definitely getting uh, a read from the FTA that that is going to be uh, 
very difficult to achieve, um, considering everything going on, particularly uh, the election, et cetera. Um, but we are still maintaining that as our target um, until and if we are unable to meet it, and then we will move forward from there. Um, then following the execution of the Small Starts Grant Agreement, we would advertise for construction. Um, we are not recommending at this time to advertise for construction in advance of receiving the grant agreement. Sometimes with uh, Small Starts Grant Agreements, you could get what is called a letter of no prejudice and allow you to proceed. Uh, but that would require us to have a plan to fill the 60 million uh, if we were to award for construction. So right now our focus is on getting that Small Starts Grant Agreement and then advertising for construction. Uh, with the schedule, construction would begin in Q2 2021 and then incorporating the uh, approved schedule for the project, revenue service would start in the third quarter of 2024. Next slide. So um, our amendment to the CIP here on this slide, you see the 2020 CIP and the funds and then the amended proposal. Um, this includes additional move Seattle funds, and we'll uh, discuss the detail of that on the next slide. I also wanted to call out um, the other city transportation funds that are noted here include uh, historical funds on this project, bridging the gap levy, some re vehicle license fee, other types of um, funds such as that, but they already are allocated and have been spent in the project. So the other city transportation funds are not the funds that we expect to use going forward. Um, we are working with um, our counterparts at City Light and SPU to incorporate drainage and wastewater and street light improvements into the project. So you see their funding there. Um, you see the King County commitment, our Connecting Washington grant. Um, those all remain the same. Then we have the Sound Transit 3 agreement that um, we were just discussing and an increase in that amount. And that increase has been um, discussed and agreed to at the staff level with Sound Transit, and that is what needs to go to the board approval along with the remainder of the amount. Um, then we have our FTA Small Starts Grant Agreement in the amount of about 60 million and our CMAC grant. Next slide. Um, so then just specifically noting the changes in the CIP, there's an increase to the Sound Transit amount of about 7.2 million um, and then as far as move seattle and this was to both of these changes are to help address the contingencies um, through the fta review we had savings in the lander street grade separation project and so that is proposed to be moved over to this project to fill that gap as well as 916,000 um, in money that won't be spent at this time on fauntleroy uh, due to the pause nature of that work um, um, Lorelai, thank you for these yes. um, sh showing the sources of funds. I think that's really important for the viewing audience to see that uh, the vast majority of these funds are non-city funds. Um, however, a, a point of a couple issues of concern for me, the filling the gap based on what you're hearing from uh, the federal government on what they wanted to see more of in this budget filling the gap did end up coming from city funds so seeing the move seattle money um the 2020 dollar amount being 15 million going up to um to 19 million um so i am i am one of the benefits of this project is most of the money is coming from other sources other than the city government at the same time, that makes the sound transit money so imperative to fund this. And if the sound transit, and I know we know sound transit is is struggling through the pandemic and, and with ridership down and their own budget deficit. So if the sound transit money is not available, um, I just want to signal my concern is that um, while this allocation of city dollars makes sense to satisfy the federal government and have a more realistic budget, um, I, I just want to flag my personal concerns about not putting uh, additional city dollars into this project uh, beyond what's being proposed today until we we have a, a, another discussion about this, about broader transportation issues um, and what are our priorities uh, as we where all levels of government are facing massive budget deficits. So, and I know you would have to come back to council for that anyway. I just wanted to flag that uh, while I support this reallocation, just 
if, if there has to be yet another reallocation, that might be a concern, especially if we just heard the bridge audit, for example, showing all the needs that we have um, regarding bridge maintenance and staffing levels. Uh, Councilmember Herbold had to um, go to another uh, appointment. She did want me to uh, put on the record for her, Councilmember Herbold, that she has concerns about the money, um, the nearly 1 million coming out of the Fauntleroy project uh, from West Seattle to supplement this. So just wanted to flag that for you. Um, and I'm sure she'll talk to you um, offline about that. Thank you. Councilmember Strauss. Uh, Councilmember Strauss, yes. Thank you. Just looking for the unmute button. Thank you, Chair Peterson. And I, I just want to center or focus in on your last comments about needing another discussion if additional city dollars were to be used. And I think that's a, a fair and appropriate uh, approach. Uh, I do want to signal my strong support for this project in particular. This one has uh, a high level of priority for me, even though it's not in my district, because this project in particular really is one of those key connections of moving the freight of people. Granted, once we are past COVID, which I am more and more convinced we will be out of this state of how we are living sooner than later. And when we do return to a more standard style of livelihood where we're using transit more readily, this bus rapid transit in particular is very important for us to have operational and operational as soon as possible. So I'm just signaling my support for using what we understand as transportation um, restricted dollars to support this project. Because again, bus rapid transit is different than rapid ride. There are a couple additional elements that bus ra true ra bus rapid transit utilizes. Um, and this project on Madison gets us so much closer to that. I'll again signal for the third time in a month, uh, Eugene has a true bus rapid transit system uh, and their true bus, bus rapid transit system has its own dedicated lanes, level platforms, all door boarding. And with all of these elements used on a single uh, line, it allows for transit frequency that is plus or minus about three minutes as compared to light rail. And so when we are looking at the need to be able to roll out the ability to move people throughout our city without using cars and when we're, we have congested roadways, rapid rides are an absolutely necessary and critical role for us. So um, signaling that I support you, Councilmember Peterson, in uh, an additional discussion if we were to use additional city dollars and also signaling to SDOT and the general public that I support this project with a high level of priority. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Council Member Strauss. Strauss. Um, um, oh, oh, Lorelei, if I may, um, one request I do have as this goes to the full council is for, the, for SDOT and the city budget office to um, put this additional information that we see here on these slides, put it into the fiscal note, because the fiscal note is not showing the sources and uses of funds in, in their totality. So here we have a nice snapshot of the sources of funds. Um, this is not in the fiscal note, and I'd like to see that in the fiscal note. In addition, the uses of funds. So we should be seeing a breakout of design, construction, cost of the buses, um, how much for street repaving, how much for utilities, what the contingency is, just seeing that all laid out in the fiscal note for the benefit of the public. I'd appreciate that. Okay, and and in response to, to your comment about uh, the risk of the Sound Transit funds, Councilmember Peterson, we are expecting at this point that Sound Transit will move, uh, take action next week to move things forward with uh, full review by the board in October. So things are moving in a positive direction. Thank you. Councilmember Peterson, may I, may I make a quick little remark? Yes, please. Uh, um, I don't wanna belabor the point, but I also want to um, signal my strong support for moving in this direction. Um, and, you know, I just wanna acknowledge the years of work and intensive work that um, SDOT and others have done, including members in the community to really see this project come to fruition. And I think, you know, when we're all sitting um, uh, sheltering in place right now for um, 
not just COVID reasons, but because of the massive climate um, crisis symptoms that we are experiencing in our region currently through the air quality impacts as a result of um, the wildfires. I just, I just think it is so important for us to um, address, you know, sort of the, the due process issues and the due diligence issues that Councilmember Peterson has um, flagged, but to remain committed to investing and advancing these really important public transit projects is one of our city's key strategies to mitigating um, uh, the realities of carbon emissions and the impact that it has on air quality. So I am, I'm, I'm looking forward to I'm continuing to support these efforts and to working with my colleagues on making sure that um, underlying concerns about how to make the investment sustainable are um, brought to fruition. So thanks so much to the chair and thank you so much to um, SDOT and others for um, your important work in this space. I really appreciate it. Council Member Strauss and Council President Gonzalez, I really appreciate the support. Thank you. Please continue, Lorelai. We're to questions. That's what we've got. So, anything else? I think we, I think we covered our questions and comments. And um, if there's nothing else further, um, we'll we'll look forward to that uh, beefed up fiscal note uh, when it advances forward here, which I think it will. Um, so, any final comments before we uh, vote on this? Council members, I, I move the committee recommend passage of Council Bill 119883. Is there a second? Second. Great. It's been moved and seconded to recommend passage of this bill. Any final comments? Okay. Will the clerk please call the roll on the committee recommendation that this bill pass? Gonzalez. Aye. Morales. Aye. Strauss. Yes. Chair Peterson. Yes. Four ayes, no noes. The motion carries and the committee recommendation that the bill pass will be sent to the September 21st city council meeting. Uh, this concludes our September 16th meeting of the Transportation Utilities Committee. The committee will um, we'll have a special meeting on September 25 to catch up on several time sensitive items before our budget season begins. After September 25th, the next regular meeting of the committee will be scheduled for December 2nd, and we'll probably have one on December 16th too. So thank you everybody for attending. It's good to see you all and we'll see you next time. Committee is adjourned. Thank you.